12 August 1983, about three days prior, I, as Al Bielik, was told, take a vacation, get off the base. Duncan was transferred to another operation on the base, and it was after that point when Duncan was given the instructions, being in the chair, a set of code words. I will use a hypothetical set of code words. The time is now. That was to set into operation the program for destruction of the Montauk base. Now, it had already been decided about six weeks prior to that, as a group got together, the group included Duncan, Preston, myself, and a number of other people, to discuss what are we going to do about this operation called Montauk. It's evil. It's done a lot of bad things. It's been going to continue unless we do something about it. And there was a number of meetings, series of meetings, off base, of course, and a number of people, some scientists, Duncan and Preston, became the core of it, decided that the station had to go, and they had to set up a technique to do it. But they finally made the decision, uh, as they knew from the records which were available, that uh, on the 12th of August, there's two guys from the Philadelphia experiment were arriving, and after we returned back, to sent back to the Eldridge, then it was clear, Preston sat Duncan down in the chair sometime in the afternoon, gave him the command, and of course out of Duncan's subconscious <coughs> was created this monster, looked like a Sasquatch from the pictures we have of it. I can't be sure it's a Sasquatch, it just resembles it somewhat. Literally came out of Duncan's subconscious. The station, having long since been proven that it could do this, clothed the thing in a physical reality of our three-dimensional reality. And this creature went stomping around the station, destroying buildings and whatever, and picking people up from the God in its way and throwing them aside someplace and killing a few. The word got around rather quickly that a monster was loose on the base. We got to stop it. It didn't come up on base operation until late afternoon, from what I was told later. But it was making uh, considerable progress in destroying buildings on the base, and then it headed for the radar tower because, uh, however it was programmed or instructed, it knew that was where the hardest things were, at least on the surface. And it went in the tower, but at that time, Pruitt <coughs> went to press and he says, you've got to uh, do something about this. But before he got to the point of accosting Preston to do it, the orders went out, kill the power on the project. <coughs> Well, they went for the main power control switches that fed power from Lilco into the tower building, the radar tower, and on the surface of the other connecting, interconnecting links of uh, computers and such. Now all of the switches were frozen, like on the Eldridge. So the word went out, go find the main power feeds and cut them, hack them with axes, what they have to do. So they found the set of feeds coming in, cut them, nothing happened. They said, there's got to be a secondary set of feeds, and there were. They found them, and they cut those. The lights went out, and that's all that happened. The lights in the buildings went out. The lights in the tower went out. So Pruitt went to Preston. He says, you're going to go in that radar tower, and you're going to start cutting things up. He says, I'm not going in there, and out came a 45. He says, oh, yes, you are, and here's a portable acetylene tank. You put it on your back, the back carrier, and you got the torch, and I'll get in there. Part of the computer system was in the radar tower, a very critical one. It was an old electronic, old tube type built by AIL, and I've seen it. I had to destroy that computer, I had to destroy the modulating system for the uh, two high-powered amplitron tubes in the tower, which were drivers for the 24 of them down in the basement, as we called it, which ran not only the memory system, but the main computer, driving all of the very exotic electronic systems. It kept the thing going. What you had to do was literally hack up the brain, cut up the feeds to the two driver tubes up in the tower. So Preston went in there and started hacking away at them with a the settling torch. You couldn't cut these electronic feeds by hand. You might electrocute yourself. So he did, and after he cut enough of the links, and there's still torch marks on the building and the interior would show, the system stopped functioning. Everything quieted down at that point, and it was essentially over. When this little operation was over and the computer was shut down, we had a little time to think about it. How was a computer able to keep functioning when we cut off all the power feeds to it? Well, quite a few years ago, Einstein made a statement which came back to mind then. 
If you develop a machine with sufficient complexity and feed it with enough power, it will in time become intelligent of itself. And this said that with this system that we had there, which had plugged into it, all of the scientific data of our creation, all of the scientific data that we know, all of the celestial data for astronomy, you name it, a machine of the size that it was, and the amount of power which it consumed, which was up around 500 megawatts, it had enough power and enough intelligence, artificial intelligence, if you will, to become intelligent. And therefore, it to solve the problem of how to feed itself power without Loco's help. And since we cut off Loco, it kept its own power feeds from whatever source going and kept running until we cut up the brain, so to speak, and shut off the ability for it to compute, to feed itself power, to do anything anymore. So that was the end of the Montauk operation as we knew it. It was the end of the surface operations. And what happened after that was interesting. About one week after they shut down on the night of 12 August, a couple of platoons of Marines came in with orders to kill anything that moved, and they were shooting all over the base. And the orders were to kill anything that moved, human or not. And he says a few more died. They were still hiding out there, quite terrified and afraid to do anything except stay on the base. A few days after that, some cement trucks start to arrive, fully loaded with cement, about 26 of them in succession. It plugged up every scale, every staircase, every known entrance to the underground which existed on the surface. Sealed them all off, even put a plug in the elevator shaft and the radar tower so that no one could from the surface without knowing special access, because a few were left open, find their way into the underground. So that was the end of surface operations. I had no contact with the underground or any of the operations until I ran into somebody in recent years who was there at that time, and they continued to function. There were obviously means of getting in and out, mm -hmm. because operations did not cease underground. They continued for another year and a half. So I was no longer functioning with Montauk, and Montauk was shut down on the surface <coughs> until 19... 87, it was four years, they did some rebuilding, not on the surface, but underground. And the underground operations persisted until sometime in 1985. That I have from a friend of mine who shut everything down at that time and then exited. <laughs>